The Easter Gospel begins from John, the 20th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran to tell Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. And she said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went to the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the other linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know, understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary, Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not ascended to the father, but I go to, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. So Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them, that he had said these things to her. This is the gospel of our Lord. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. Well, when we first moved to Jerusalem, my wife Jenny and I had the benefit of spending a few weeks with our predecessors. The previous program coordinators walked us through an annual calendar and showed us the resources that they had accumulated they drove us around and introduced us to all the school administrators, the teachers, the program managers that would supervise the young adults in Global Mission volunteers. Best of all, they arranged lunches and dinners with each of the host families who had been willing to host a Yagam in their home. I'll never forget the curiosity I felt when they told us, now this family is amazing, but there's one special accommodation that we make so that the volunteer can stay in the larger, the old home. And then of course they said, it'd be better if they explain it themselves. And so we were left in suspense. Well, as it turned out, when we visited, we discovered that the host family is amazing. They're lovely, they're welcoming people, they're expert Palestinian cooks. And when they walked us over to the house where the volunteers would stay, they explained that this was the old family home during Ottoman period. This was the home where grandma raised seven children, including the host father. It was an older home, more than 200 years old in fact, but they wanted to keep it in good condition and do that by having someone use it, by having someone living in it. Well, when we looked inside the house, we learned about the special accommodation. They said, that's grandma's room. She has a, little, a key and keeps the room locked, but she needs to come in every day just for a little bit of time. Well, Christ is risen and Mary is weeping. 
From a distance, Mary Magdalene looked and saw that the stone had been rolled away. And Mary can only think the worst. Someone has taken the body. When we meet Mary this morning, it's hard for her to imagine seeing things get any worse. And it, then they do. Mary goes to tell the disciples and finds Peter and the beloved disciple. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. The two disciples come running to see as soon as Mary tells them the body is stolen. The gospel tells us, then Peter and the other disciples set out and went towards the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. And so the other disciple who reached the tomb first went in too. He saw and believed, but they didn't understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. And this year, we hear then what happened the disciples returned home. The disciples returned home. Friends, this is an unprecedented time. In fact, the situation is so unprecedented in modern time that one of the ELCA bishops out east put on their Facebook, quote, if I have to hear the word unprecedented one more time, dot, dot, dot because he was so tired of hearing from elected officials who just wanted to do something, but they were really worried about doing the wrong thing. Well, here in Minnesota, we don't shelter in place with the formality of that mandate. No, Governor Waltz, who's been doing a commendable job, in my opinion, uh, made the decision to give a little more flexibility with this home-cooked, made-to-order time where we're called to stay at home. It is an unprecedented time, but staying at home to stay safe in itself isn't really news at all, is it? In our reading of the Easter story from John, it's different from all the other Gospels retelling the story of Easter, because in it, we know right where the disciples are. They're at home. Some of them are together, some of them are in the homes of other friends and family, but at the moment, it is just not a good idea for them to be out and about. The disciples have defaulted to their own form of social distancing. Their concern is less about viral droplets and more about being recognized. Recognized as Jesus' disciples, recognized as Galileans, recognized as having close connections, maybe even showing that they were devoted followers of this Jesus of Nazareth who has just been executed, who was an activist who said that he was a king. Well, to be honest, I don't blame the disciples for enacting their own safety precautions, their own time to socially distance and stay at home. But let me tell you a little bit more about grandma. And actually, first of all, let me tell you a little bit more uh, about a miracle. During Holy Week in Jerusalem, a miracle happens every year. It's called the Holy Fire. On Easter Saturday, or if you like Easter Vigil, the Orthodox Christian world sets their eyes on Jerusalem. Pilgrims from all over the Orthodox world, like Russia and Greece, the Ukraine, Slavic countries, and a very distinctive contingent from Ethiopia, the Ethiopian Orthodox. On Easter Saturday, they gather in tens of thousands gathering around the tomb of Jesus in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and for a couple hours, they go there and wait. In that enormous 1,800-year-old church, every light and candle goes dark. The Orthodox Patriarch of Jerusalem, he comes out in his procession, and then they search his robes, they search all those crevices, they search his great hat, and then he goes into the tomb of Jesus with unlit candles, 
and he waits. Personally, I've always wondered what he does in there while he waits, though, right? Outside, there's uh, other priests, there's thousands of people who are quietly praying and reading the gospel. But I wonder if there's a prayer that helps him during that hour or two that he's waiting there, holding his candle in the darkness. And then, in the darkness, a divine spark appears. The light of the resurrection arrives into the darkness of the tomb. The patriarch comes out and he shares the divine fire first with the other heads of the churches. And then the fire sweeps through the church and is passed from person to person in the crowd. The scouts have a special role there. They have a pipe and drum corps band and they help to lead the procession of the holy fire throughout the, the narrow stone streets of the old city of Jerusalem before sending the fire out to the other churches. Some of the holy fire is taken immediately to the airport and flown by plane to Greece and Russia and a handful of other churches throughout the Orthodox world. But well, personally, when I first started learning about it, I had uh, a lot of questions. A lot of questions about the holy fire until the first time I was in the old city when it happened. I had lit, I had brought a little bundle of candles that is traditionally what people uh, bring around. And I had lit my little bundle of candles from the torch of a singing and beaming Syrian Orthodox priest. And so now after that experience of pure Easter joy, I was hurrying out to the parking lot because I wanted to get my van out uh, before traffic started really getting bad. So as you do in, in these old cities, you turn the corner and then suddenly you see a very different scene. And I started following a little family who was walking home with those tiny glass Ikea lanterns that holds a little single votive candle. And it was lit in their little lantern. They were bringing the holy fire home with them. And I thought to myself, oh man, I want to have the holy fire. I want to have the fire of the resurrection in my home too. Well, it turns out that that's exactly what grandma had in her little room in the Ottoman house. Grandma had been through a lot. She had raised seven kids on her own after her husband died in a car accident when her youngest wasn't even out of diapers yet. She was tough and she was kind and she was a patient teacher of Arabic to those volunteers who came from Europe and America and stayed with their family. But through it all, every day she visited her little prayer space in her room and in a space that had photos of her loved ones and icons of Jesus and the saints who protected them. And it turns out each day when she went into her little room, she was tending the flame. Each day she would make sure that the holy fire, the fire of the resurrection, that it was still lit. So each day she would light the candles for family members, for the saints, and each new Easter, she would bring her own little lantern. She would bring the fire from the church and rekindle that light of hope in her own home. You know, in our reading this morning, back in the garden, Mary didn't follow the disciples home. Mary's been weeping and she decided to look in the tomb for herself. And through her tears, she saw two angels in the tomb and she kept on weeping. And then she turned around and she saw another figure and she answered his question too. But then, finally, it takes just one word, just one word to break through the veil of her grief and sorrow when she hears a familiar voice say her name, Mary. Mary, Jesus says, and Rabuni, she cries. 
Rabuni means teacher, but it means my teacher. More than that, Mary cries out and she speaks a name that means hope. A name that opens up a future for her. A name that means new life, breaking into the world. And when Mary hears Jesus call her name, she draws that life-giving figure of her teacher into an embrace. She must have, right? Mary must have hugged Jesus because the very next thing Jesus says to her is, do not hold on to me. So with a word, God called forth light into the creation in Genesis and in the garden in the resurrection, one word sparks new life and this new creation begins again. The fire begins as a tiny flame when Mary goes to tell the other disciples, when Mary Magdalene becomes the first preacher of the resurrection. But that tiny flame, it grows and it spreads, not as a great all-consuming bonfire, but from candle to candle, from person to person, from my home to your home, from generation to generation. In your own baptism, while your hair, if you had any, was still wet, some faithful saint held a candle and said these words to you too. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. In your own baptism, you inherited the resurrection promise that the things we do to make a difference in this world, will live on. That our relationships, the way that we treat one another, and that those will continue on. That the things that we do will endure in the new creation that began with an empty tomb. So maybe, maybe this is the miracle. The miracle that happened on the first... Easter, the miracle of the holy fire, the miracle that grandma attended in her little room, the miracle of a resurrection flame. We are, each of us, all of you, invited to have and to keep that light, to keep the light in your life, to keep it burning in your home, to shine on your loved ones, to shine hope on all of our prayers, to shine the hope that doesn't overpower, but brings a little more hope and a little more light into each of our homes and each of our days. In this unprecedented time, may you keep the holy fire of this unprecedented Easter morning kindled in your home and in your life. May the fire of the resurrection burn bright in you, throwing divine light into every closed room, every dark tomb, every fear of death, and every struggle with grief. May the light of Christ's hope and resurrection be rekindled in you. And may the peace of God that passes all human understanding keep your hearts and your thoughts in this resurrected Jesus our Lord. Amen.